With the Cold War and the growth of what was called the Red Menace, the superheroes fought against communists. Comics fell victim to the political climate, however. They were censored and their content was watered down. By the early 50s, superheroes were reduced to very tame adventures. All the same, the genre seemed to find a second wind when DC Comics produced Flash and Green Lantern. But superheroes made their major comeback in 1961 with the first issue of the Fantastic Four and the appearance of Marvel Comics. Times had changed and Americans were concerned about the effects of nuclear power, speculating that exposure to radiation could cause mutations Artist Jack Kirby and writer Stan Lee developed characters that were tormented, enigmatic, and different. People keep asking, between the Stanley and Jack Kirby team, who did what? I got to work with Stan, I got to work with Jack. I found that it was very difficult for even them to discern it. Obviously, Jack did the drawing. Obviously, Stan did the dialogue. The concepts, the basic ideas, the plots, the, the, the underlying philosophies, the characters came from both. And not always from the one you would think. People assume, oh, well, Jack came up with the cosmic visions and Stan came up with the human traits and, and personalities. And what I found was that some cases it was the exact opposite. In the beginning, I would give him detailed outlines of what the story should be. But after a very short time, we would just talk for five or ten minutes. I would tell him who I wanted the villain to be and what I wanted the problem or the menace to be. And then I'd let Jack go and draw it any way he wanted to. And he would add so much to the story with his artwork. And then he'd give me back the drawings and I would put in the dialogue and I'd put in the captions. So it was a true collaboration. We both really worked on those stories. The synthesis of the two creators created um, just an amazing number of characters and premises that just were fantastic. I think Stan um, with Jack created a method of working, this uh, sort of the Marvel way of working where a writer would write a plot and, and then the artist would really freely interpret that plot and then the writer would script it again. And that's still being used, you know, by half the industry today. <laughs> During his partnership with Jack Kirby, Stan Lee also worked for Marvel Comics with many other talented artists or writers. Mary Severin, Steve Ditko, John Bossema, Roy Thomas, Gene Colan, John Romita, Neil Adams. Each made a distinct contribution and the team they formed was highly productive. Daredevil, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, Iron Man, there seemed to be no limit to the new series. Stan Lee tailored the scenarios to fit the world of his young readers, and very soon, the teens of the 60s began to feel involved in the problems of identity or integration into society encountered by these heroes who were so different. I would like to think the, the main difference between the characters that we created at Marvel and the ones that had been in existence before that, the other ones were a little bit one-dimensional. You didn't know anything about them except what their power was, and you knew who the villain was, and you saw them fight the villain. 
I tried to make our characters so that their personal lives were just as interesting as their adventure. Stan brought a whole different approach to superheroes, and it broke up the boring uh, fight scenes that sometimes you could have 10 pages of fight scenes in some superhero comics, and ma thus making them boring. But he broke them up with personal life. All of those things added to the dimension. With the Fantastic Four, the fact that he gave them conflicting personalities and having them constantly bickering amongst themselves, and then a romance between two of the characters. Uh, that's strictly Stanley. I think Spider-Man probably turned out to be the most realistic of all our characters. First of all, as far as I know, there had never been a teenage superhero before. Teenagers had always been um, sidekicks for a hero. But here I wanted the teenager to really be the hero. And since he was a teenager, I tried to give him all the problems that most teenagers have. He worried about making a living, worried about his family. He worried about getting dates with girls. Spider-Man is probably the least bo boisterous of the, uh, of the mainstream superheroes. He's not an invulnerable Superman. Um, he's not a dark bat Batman-like figure. Um, he seems a more or less normal, anxiety-ridden fellow um, who could use a girlfriend. Spider-Man clearly needs female companionship. He's raised by his Aunt May. He has the sort of self-doubts and sort of needs comforting because of his existential anxieties in a way that the other superheroes don't. They are so super, um, it's difficult to relate humanly to them. What Stan Lee did was that he came in and he created characters that although they had these superhuman powers, they were very much like you or me or anyone else. Uh, we all have Achilles heels. We all have problems that we're either trying to resolve in our lives or trying to run away from in our lives. And that's what Stan did. He, he, that was the beauty of the Marvel Universe when it started was characters with feet of clay. Uh, they, there was always you know, although they, they were these godlike creatures with the costume, there was always something else going on behind the mask. Stan generally imposes on artists to use their ability to tell a story and then utilizes it so it saves him time. One of the best things that he ever uh, stumbled on was the plot instead of a script. So he gave people a plot which made people like, my, like myself and uh, John Buscema and uh, Gene Colan exercise our ability to ter tell a story. He was always enthusiastic looked at your pages, paid attention, and generally the feedback was very, very positive. He asked us to clothe the people in current styles, 
and to have the young men dress the way young men dress when they go to school and to go to work. He said, the worst thing you can do is to make it look like a comic book that was done 10 years earlier. So we were always aware to stay modern. We were reflecting the current time. So when the social content in the 60s was decided on, it was not accidental. It was Stan asking us to reflect daily life. And when Vietnam became a problem, we did campus problems, uh, radical uh, students. We did a lot of very interesting things. Stan just felt that it was vital to make it current. There was one time, I just remember, I received a letter from Washington, D.C., from the Office of Health, Education, and Welfare. And they said, because of the big problem with drugs in the country, they would appreciate it if I could do some sort of story in, in the Spider-Man book to mention to the readers the dangers of drug addiction. So I don't ever like to lecture, but I had a little sequence in the story, a little part where a friend of Spider-Man's had taken to, I don't know much about drugs myself, he took something and it made him think he was a bird and he could fly, and he was up on top of the roof and Spider-Man tried to talk him down. And that was it. Well, when we sent that book to the code, they sent it back and said, you can't print that. I said, why? They said, you're not allowed to use drugs in your stories. I said, but this is a story that is anti-drug. It's to teach youngsters that taking drugs is dangerous. No, we're sorry, you can't do it. But I was asked to do it by a branch of the United States government. We're sorry, you can't do it. So I figured the hell with it, and I printed the books anyway, and I didn't put the code seal on the cover. So he did not say approved by the comic book code or whatever it said. When we did drugs, we did not make it a documentary on drugs. We made it a human drama with how drugs can affect the character. And we did it as we always did. We, we put the, the pill inside some honey and made it entertaining first and the message second. Most of the superheroes created by Stan Lee are still amazingly popular today. They are published in close to 75 countries and translated into 25 languages and are much loved. was responsible for a major innovation. It gave its supervillains superpowers. Until then, the hero's enemies were usually mad scientists, gangsters, robots, or monsters from outer space. The Marvel villain was super powerful, a perfect foil for the hero, his evil twin. Evil was accepted as the necessary counterpart of good. Made your shackles out of indestructible titanium too, eh? Justice will be served, and all of you will suffer for your crimes against Norman Osborn. For justice is blind no longer! <laughs> all you megalomaniacs have such a weird sense of humor. <laughs> supervillain is almost identical in a lot of respects to the hero. Last! Looks like a mistrial! This court is adjourned! They've, they've taken similar paths in life, 
The difference between the villain and the hero is the villain took one step in the wrong direction. The closer you can make the villain to the hero, the more effective you have a villain. And to be honest with you, really, what also makes the book, what makes the story, is the villain. It takes a short time to create a hero. Okay, you've created the hero, you have the hero. Now, he's set. But the villains, you've got to be working on them all the time. Every month, it's got to be a new one. Or, if you bring back an old one, there has to be a new angle. There's got to be something new he wants to do, and do it in a different way. So, I always spent most of my time working on the villains. A good hero is only a good hero if his villain is a good villain. The nature of comic books and of all uh, heroes is that the villains have to be worthy of them. So as more heroes were created, more villains were created, almost by the nature of it. And the saddest hero is the hero that doesn't have good villains. The nature, how, what characters do you like? Well, I like Batman because he's got good villains. It's the uh, yin yang, you know, you have to have uh, strength in both. And in fact, it's, I think it's harder to create a good villain than it is to create a good hero. Um, because a good villain has to be very believable, but also very evil. And also, you have to make him a little sympathetic. You, he cannot be completely out there. Um, again, the more people can relate to the villain, but realize that I wouldn't do that, I think the better the character you create. And so when you look at universes that have been around for 40 years now, Marvel and DC, you can name on one hand you know, the total number of great villains. Dr. Doom was something Stan Lee could get his teeth into. Made him a great, great villain. And Victor Von Doom was a scientist. He had an explosion, his face is destroyed. It was like Phantom of the Opera. Puts an iron mask on. How could you not like a character like that? Dr. Doom is the greatest villain probably. Uh, maybe Galactus is even greater. Just think of the size of Galactus. Just think of the power of Galactus. Only Jack Kirby and Stan Lee could have come up with that. A person who devours planets. In my wildest dreams, I would have never created a character like that. That is beyond belief. And then to have the Silver Surfer roaming through the space, looking for planets for his master to, to devour. Absolutely a miracle, strange character. Jack Kirby's imagination stands alone. He was so creative that he threw away more good ideas than most people have in their lifetime. Okay? If he ever threw anything away at all, I'm sure he forgot more good ideas than most people have. I think that, that explains Jack Kirby, the most creative force I have ever seen. As far as superhero comics, he was a genius. And he revolutionized the superhero comics, as far as I'm concerned. We all learned from Jack. And I don't care who you talk to, everybody learned from Jack that working today. We all learned from Jack. We all got something from him. Jack was very prolific. He was very different. He was the only artist I knew that would start at the top. And he would not rough out a drawing. He just started one line and finish off a drawing, which is amazing. I could never do that. And he was extremely fast. And he was different. Jack was very different. And I think you'll find that along the way for most brilliant people, you know. They were the different, they stood out from the crowd. And Jack certainly stood out, you know. When you turned the page, it exploded in your face, his drawings. His drawings was, it was the tension in all his panels, everything, the expressions. And you could feel the energy on every page that he drew, everything. You could criticize, you could say, well, the hands are wrong, the head, maybe he made the nose too small, maybe he made this one. Doesn't matter. He could tell a story like no one could tell. There was a certain nobility in all of Jack's characters. He had a very positive view of mankind. And he actually quarreled a few times with other comic book writers and artists who he felt had a, a, a much more negative view of mankind. 
I think that's one of the reasons that Jack was so good at doing superheroes, because his heroes, when they reached their peak moments of heroism, were truly beautiful people. They were, they were well-drawn, they were strong, they were vital, and they were very energized. Everything Jack drew was energized, but especially the heroes when they were at their peak moments of heroism. To be truthful about anyone influenced by comics, if you've been reading comics and drawing comics in the last 30, 40 years, you had to have been influenced by some contribution of Jack to comics. And Jack is that man for hundreds of characters. Uh, chiefly, he designed the Fantastic Four, Captain America, Iron Man, the Hulk, the X-Men, the Demon, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. And I mean, he, he, he created one of the greatest majorities of superheroes that any one person ever has. And he would wind up being the most influential person on the entire medium of American comics. of American comics have managed to develop, adapt, and grow as characters. Some were created more than half a century ago, and yet they regularly embark on new adventures. Even though new characters have been created since, the older ones still spark the imaginations of young artists who have enriched the character's world with a modern vision, a fresh inspiration. Today, Bill Sienkiewicz, Dave Gibbons, Alex Ross, and others are the heirs of Siegel and Schuster, Bob Kane, or Jack Kirby. These characters are elevated to the stature of being such icons that uh, they're not necessarily the replacement of my gods, per se, but I guess if the parallel were to an earlier culture where people spent that much time painting portraits of Jesus and the saints, it would be that kind of feeling towards the material. There's that level of respect, but then there's also a respect I have that's very knowing of what the original creators intended when they conceived these characters, and I always want to pay special tribute to what those people had done before. In every case of the superheroes I've worked with, I've re-examined them from the point of bringing out the original artist's works, and I want that to sort of infect my mind before I do my reinterpretation. The comic book heroes have stayed around so long because they continually reinvent themselves. Um, that's part of them having attained mythological status. Myths keep changing. And part of the way they keep changing is they keep being reinvented. Uh, every so and so often, the reinvention is really going back to the beginning. They become new by going back to their origin. Although the great superheroes have always retained their basic essence, their appearance has changed radically over the years to suit the current era. For instance, Batman as drawn by Bob Kane or Dick Sprang was followed by Carmine Infantino's version before Neil Adams took over in the 70s. The character has since appeared in versions by Frank Miller, Brian Boland, and dozens of others. The best of the comic characters, Superman, Batman, Captain Marvel, there is something archetypal about them that I think is so robust 
that it will withstand all kinds of hard treatment or different treatment. And certainly, I mean, it's given me a great thrill to be able to draw the adventures and occasionally write the adventures of characters I loved when I was a kid. It's a little bit like um, having a play with somebody else's toys. You think, wow, there's that really cool Superman toy, you know, I can make him do this, and here he is talking to Lois Lane, and, and you know, or to write the Joker, for instance. It's, it's, just, it's just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And certainly, um, I've never had a dream about Superman or Batman. But I almost feel like, in a dreamlike way, that I, I know them, or I have met them, or I would, I would recognise them. But when you come to write Superman or Batman, you know what they would say, or you know how they would behave, or you'll come up with something and you think, no, Superman would never do that. You know, they actually have taken on an existence of, of their own. It's a tricky question when you're talking about characters that different generations have grown up with and yet that are owned by a large corporation. You can come in and you can do a truly terrific story with Batman and yet the company owns it. If you're okay with that, that's a great way to work. You know, there, are a lot, there have been generations of comic book writers and illustrators and animators who are just dying for their chance at bat. I want to come up and I want to do Superman. I've got the Superman story that I am dying to tell. I've got the Joker story or the uh, Aquaman story or whoever, and that's great. If you want to come in and work under those terms, welcome to have you, you know, and, and, and come on in. But, you know, there, there is the downside that comics sort of moves on. You can join the circus for a while, but the circus tends to move on, and either you move with it or it moves on without you. And at the end of the day, I know that as much as I like Batman or uh, any of the characters in his world, in fact, some of the characters I've created for his world, at the end of the day, I have to just kind of say bye-bye, you know, and, and go back to my own characters because I don't own these guys. I just, you know, come in, have fun, and send them on their way. Beyond everything else, it's a business. What we're in is the comic book business is a business. And in order to keep the readers interested and wanting to read the material, you have to give them new stuff. The, I think that the whole... Uh, heart of the reader who picks up a comic books is to see something different, to read something different that's occurring. If they come to know what to expect from story to story, then you've just lost a reader. So in changing and putting another artist on it, it gives a little bit of a different variation on the character. To give him a kind of different kind of story, let him die, let him come up let him be reborn again, let him fly, let him, let him have uh, worse Achilles heels, let him turn into you, anything to make it different from what it was before. And that's what their attempt is, and I think that's what we have to do as a business. story is a different skill than drawing per se and, and so uh, when we lay out stories when I lay out a story you want to create something that um, looks exciting but is not confusing something that looks dynamic but is not overly dressed up in the old days they had a fairly typical way of telling a story three tiers maybe two three panels per tier so you would have a total of uh, six seven panels a page and then maybe at one splash page, and they would just do this very regularly. And I think in the 70s, um, with the uh, advent of the counterculture, or, you know, there's more dynamic things in, in graphics and advertising and illustration, you start seeing people change things, you know, hands coming out of borders, uh, uh, panel, three panels going straight up and down, you know, no longer three tiers, uh, panels at angles, uh, you know, characters being reflected in doorknobs, uh, you know, stories being told where you'd see a building through a reflection of an eyeglass instead of a drawing of the building per se. So, um, 
And then you add on top of that in the 80s uh, the influence of MTV and our understanding of how stories are told. It, it can all change. You know, you see something like Natural Born Killers and see Gone with the Wind. You know, it's completely different techniques. But today's kids and readers are more sophisticated because they've grown up on MTV. They, they've seen these kinds of movies. And so in comics, it reflects that because we're all part of society. So you're start, you see a lot of different things going on that you didn't see before. Don't you people ever die? Superheroes are, are a phenomenon in our culture. First of all, they're good characters just for movies because we're always looking for an original and a different way to make action movies. And that also makes it very difficult because the fans, they see those superheroes in their minds. It was a comic, it was a cartoon, and now it's a movie. So now you can't have a character running around in yellow and blue spandex because it doesn't make sense. It's going to be funny. So we dress them in black so they camoufl they're camouflaged, you know, by the night, by the darkness. And, um, and explain it to the fans why we're going to do that, so that they'll allow us to do that. Um, the strength of X-Men is that it has been around for 35 years, so we have an older fan base who grew up with the comic, and a younger fan base that is just discovering it today. Mutants, X-Men, are outsiders and very much misunderstood. It's all about prejudice, yes. I mean, X-Men, you know, the, the, the world uh, fears and hates them. So there's an accessibility to these characters. Um, when the X-Men come of age, when they go through puberty, that's when their powers are evident. And it's very hard as a child uh, going through puberty because suddenly your body, you're doing things that you don't understand. Same thing with the mutants. Suddenly they, they go like that and lightning comes out and it's hard to understand it. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very identifiable. We need to talk. You see, you and I have something in common. Batman. To destroy Batman, we must first turn him into what he hates the most. Namely, us. Maybe this isn't a good time to mention this, but my license has expired! There's no question that, that all the terrifically gifted visual directors, Spielberg, Lucas, Burton, pay homage to comics, you know, in, in their movies, whether it's directly or if they directly do, you know, adapt a comic book character or if they look at comics for certain technique in styling or visualization or the way that the, there were certain compositions in comic book panels that they've, they've looked at or just the imagination. Batman was one of the few comics even early on that had a darker color scheme to it, which I, I liked. I think that was probably my favorite comic by far, you know, so, and I, I, I did respond to that loneliness and that sort of isolated quality of him, and I think, you know, that, that's, that's why I think that was my favorite of all those comic characters. And the universe, you know, I, I like characters that have dual, you know, Catwoman and Penguin represent that sort of tortured animal human side and and I, I think that those are all the whole Batman universe really tapped into like in a way a good myth will tap into the the, the, the sort of subconscious sides of people for me he was the best character, and the villains were the best characters. They, were, they had the most psychologically sound profiles, you know? They kind of hit the root of what comics were about.
it's hard to separate the superhero comic book from the whole mass marketing phenomenon. The audience for comic books per se has become smaller and smaller. You used to be able to buy comic books at any corner store. Uh, now there are specialty comic shops. Um, so the comics have become a more devoted, more specialized audience. So it's not just the comic books, it's the films and action figures and books and theme parks and posters. And uh, it's a much more mass marketing campaign. So one can no longer separate out the comic book superhero from the superhero product. Spider-Man is an amazingly licensed product. Uh, they're from skateboards to sneakers to food. Spider-Man's everywhere. Um, and again, it's, it, it, that is just again, a testimonial to how wonderful the character was when it was created, it, that so many people can relate to this character in a million different ways. You know, we have people playing video games who will never read a Spider-Man book, but love the video game. The superhero genre has changed. The violence is more explicit, and the hero has become an anti-hero, battling in a sometimes bloody universe. The genre now reflects a world in which the very perception of good and evil has changed considerably. heroes question ourselves so I, I think I think what what what's very American about these characters is that they 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 change as the country does uh, they 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 move with us and they move us and they uh, they're just part of the fabric of what makes I guess American things cult you know colorful and at the same time they're also very commercial I think that there is a lack of humor in, in comics now I think um, in some of them, I mean, it, 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 they've taken themselves way too seriously. Um, I think I could count on. Well, I, I would have. I would have. You know, I can count on both hands and toes. You know, and somebody else's hands and toes. All of the characters that were revamped into a darker, grittier version. So that's the, one of the, the big changes for me for comics was that they um, they became darker and grittier in general. I, I'm on two schools of thought here. I, I'm glad that comic books aren't simplistic and that violence is being portrayed in a more realistic manner. But I think that there are, I s maybe sometimes have problems with the throwaway aspect of the violence. They, they'll do something incredibly violent and then behave as if they don't realize what just happened. There's, the, everyone's numb to the things that are happening around them. They'll be covered in blood, and no one is upset by it. So maybe if the characters became a little more aware of the brutality of their world, then it, it wouldn't be so, so strange to see this violence. I, I think that's the problem I have with it, is that the violence in itself, I don't have a problem with. It's the reactions to the violence that I think are disturbing.
comics were were always fun and i think that by getting so serious and taking themselves so seriously i think that they lost some of what made them so interesting to kids so it, i have a feeling that it's it's cyclical it goes around i think that there may be a whole avenue of um of an approach that's going to be uh lighter although i've seen it turning now uh, we, we went through a whole big dark period, and I think now people are ready to see their heroes be heroic again. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of that also had to do with the climate here in the United States, for example, especially with, with American comics. You know, we went through a, through a whole series of, of, of events, you know, starting in, you know, the, the 70s with Watergate and, and, and our heroes no longer living up to heroic ex expectations. So it only made sense that we'd be looking at comics and our and our paper heroes in the exact same way Imagination is one of the most important qualities that we have, and it should be nurtured. And I think one good thing about these superhero stories is that they feed the imagination, because every writer who does these kind of stories is trying to imagine something new, something exciting, something the reader hasn't seen before, and who knows what it'll all lead to. Many times people said, aren't you sick of superheroes? I said, aren't the readers sick? Why aren't the readers sick of it? But they kept coming back and new generations enjoyed it. The whole thing is a shock to me. I never dreamed that I would spend my whole career doing superheroes. Amazing to me. It's the biggest shock of my life. I'm still surprised. <laughs>